Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. So good to see each and every one of you. Uh, got a few things I want to uh, announce for you um, before we get started tonight. But welcome back at the Wednesday night service. I'm so glad to be back. We've been out um, three Wednesdays now, and I feel like it's been forever. But I am excited about being back in the house of the Lord uh, for our midweek service. And so good to see each and every one of you. I know we got some core students in here with us tonight. So uh, keep Pastor Ryan, Pastor Candy in your prayers. Um, they do not have COVID, but they are feeling down, and just by doctor's request, um, they are not here tonight just to make sure that uh, their symptoms don't get any worse, but they just got probably just a little head cold, but they do not have COVID, so um, uh, just keep them in your prayers, and uh, hopefully we'll see them back Sunday morning, and uh, we are excited about that. We are excited about the series we just started on repairing the breach um, if you were here two Sundays ago, I started a, ser a sermon called Looking Ahead, but we, you, we preached the whole message on looking behind you, and uh, that was intentional. The second part of that is going to be focused on the looking ahead, but that is still a part of our series, Repairing the Breach. Um, this past Sunday, was we had an amazing service, had a lot of visitors, had a full house, and I was excited about that, and God is doing some good things. So keep that in your prayers as we continue to move forward on um, Repairing the Breach. Also, I want to start the year off right. I know I've asked you guys to join me in a fast, um, whether you do it sporadically throughout the month or you do it straight or you may do more. I just ask that at minimum if you guys would join me and commit this month to three days of all-out fasting. You might do um, three days. One day might be spread out over a couple days, but if it takes you three days to fast three meals, count that as one day. Does that make sense? But um, three days of all-out fasting, and when I say all-out fasting, I mean complete, completely doing away with what the body is saying it wants and then giving every ounce of that energy that you would normally give to food or to water or to hobbies and give that to God. Study His Word and pray like never before because, church, we need prayer more than ever today. And um, I'm telling you, no matter what's going on in our world today and no matter what's shaking our foundations as a nation, um, there is nothing that is shaking God. He is not caught off guard. He is not caught by surprise. So I promise you, if there's nobody in this world you can trust, you can trust the Lord. Amen? And uh, so with that being said, I wanted to start the year off right, something I hope to do more this year um, as well. So uh, I will announce them ahead of time so you can prepare for it. But this coming Sunday night, we will be having a prayer service. Um, we're going to pray. We're going to pray over specific things, um, but we're going to have in between specific prayers, we're going to have moments of worship, just worship. And you can, you can sit in a pew and worship. You can walk around and worship. And periodically, we're going to have people get up. And they're they're going to pray over specific things um, going on in our world today, going on in our churches today. Um, and then also, we're going to have a time for any, anybody that needs specific prayer. If you want to stand in the gap for somebody, if you want to stand in for prayer for yourself, um, I do believe in the laying on of hands. I believe that, that what the Bible says, that if any two or three should agree as touching one thing, that whatsoever they ask, it shall be done. The Bible says we'll have power to lay our hands on the sick and they will recover. The Bible says if any are sick among you, let them call upon the elders of the church and let them pray. Amen. So I believe in the power of prayer. I, be, I miss, I remember as a little boy being drug, drugged to church about every day of the week for something, whether it was a men's prayer meeting, women's prayer meeting, Two church services on Sunday, church on Wednesday, um, you know, all through the week we had something going on. And I really, really miss those prayer meeting services where it's not about a man preaching. It's not about a specific singer. It's simply about seeking the face of God. And I believe you, if, if Northwoods Church is, is going to go further than where we are today, it's going to take some hardcore praying. Amen. So if you can be here, that'll be this coming Sunday at uh, 6 o'clock. We're going to start at 6 o'clock. That way we can, uh, don't get you home real late. Um, and if at any point during the prayer service, if you need to leave, um, you'll be free to do so. But uh, we're going to start at 6, and we're just going to follow the leading of the Lord after that. So be praying up to that point, and then come join us for prayer if you can. Amen? All right. So we're getting ready to start a series tonight, and I've, I've asked Brother Mike Toomey, my dad, to, to lead us in a series that um, I heard him teaching um, a while back as he was pastoring his church, and it's leading up to a sermon that I want to preach in the upcoming future, but I believe laying the foundation and understanding of the biblical text 
about the, the temple of God and the tabernacle that they built is going to be very important. So I've asked him to take us through a series here on Wednesday nights. It might take three weeks, might take eight weeks. We're going to follow the leading of the Lord. I told him just whatever the Lord leads him to do, whatever he discovers, just bring it to us. Um, we're in no rush, so we're going to follow the leading of the Lord on Wednesday nights. But as for the next few weeks, I do know we will be on this uh, series. So please be ready to hear, be ready to understand, be ready to, to take in what the Lord has given us through his word. Tonight is, is I and mean, Wednesday nights are, are strictly, you know, focused on discovering God's word. You know, a lot of times on Sundays we'll get God's Word and then we'll get the message for a specific need. But Wednesday nights we are here to, to look into His Word alone and just let His Word teach us, guide us, and direct us. Amen? All right. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet tonight. Also, we do have an offering plate up front. Sister Ashley, will you bring that? Um, you don't have to come right now, but I'm going to set it right here at, uh, um, as, after we pray. Um, if you want, if you have an offering you want to give, you can. Or if you want to do like um, a lot of us do, you can wait till the end of service and you want to give an offering. Feel free to do that. I want to say thank you guys so much for all of your support. Thank you uh, for helping us. We are we have challenged the church that by the end of February, early March, that we would be able to purchase some chairs for the side seating, and um, we are steadily seeing income come in for that. So thank you guys. We are asking about seventy five dollars per chair. Um, we may be able to get them a little cheaper, and if so, the only way we're going to get them a little cheaper is we have to order more, so we're still going to look about $75 a chair, but we will get more chairs for the money, so I'm excited about that, but be in prayer about that. If you want to help with that, please do so. If you do do it, please make sure you mark on there and let us know it is for the chairs or else it'll go into our general fund, so let us know if that's what you're giving for, but if you do, can't give the full 75 but you do want to help, um, anything will be supportive. We appreciate that, but... Thank you so much for all you do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'm going to ask my mom to come. She's going to lead us in a song of worship. Father God, we thank you right now for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord God. Lord, that I know that with everything going on around us today, God, that it causes fear to rise up, Lord God. It causes anger. It causes anxiety. It causes frustration to rise up. But, Lord, those none of those emotions were given by your Holy Spirit, God. For you did not give us the spirit of fear, but you gave us the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, God. So I'm asking you this evening, God, that you would just give us strength strength to look to the hills from whence cometh our help, for we know that our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, God. Lord, that we will not be shaken, we will not be moved, for we are the body of Christ, Lord God. We are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid, God, that we are we are called to be warriors for Christ. We are called to stand up and to shine the light, Lord. At this dark hour, Lord, let us be the light to a world that is being stricken with fear, God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we wouldn't turn anyone to an opinion or to a thought, but we would simply set out to turn people to you. Lord, that you are our Savior, you are our friend, you are our brother. Lord, you are the one that gave your life for us, and we thank you for that. So, God, we ask you right now, bless this service tonight. Give us ears to hear, give us minds that will understand, and give us hearts ready to receive and discern, God, what you are teaching us as we focus in on this study. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you will, will you give my mom a hand as she comes and leads us in a song of praise? And then after she gets done, we're going to turn it over, go ahead and turn it over to Brother Mike. I looked apart, blend in with the rest of the church crowd. I know the routine to list all the Bible studies in town. Watch Christian TV, I know all the preachers and their cliches. I've been born again, and without a doubt, I know I'm saved. Sometimes I hurt, sometimes I cry, sometimes I can't get it right, no matter how hard I seem to try. Sometimes I fall down, stumble over my own disguise. I try to look strong as the whole world looks on, but 
sometimes alone I cry I try to speak faith Never give the devil one inch to get in I do worship and praise Let everybody know just where that I stand And on the back of my ride Is a fish and a cross for the world to see I know God is good all the time There's just no doubt for me This whole world looks on, but sometimes alone I cry. We all fall down sometimes. We all gonna make mistakes, but God is good all the time. Sometimes I fall down, stumble over my own disguise. I try to look strong as this whole world looks on, but sometimes alone. This whole world looks on, but sometimes alone I cry. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, one of my favorite songs. Is this your phone? Yeah. You can be seated. It's good to see everyone this evening. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to uh, let tonight be the introduction to the study on the temple or the uh, tabernacle uh, in the wilderness. Uh, Josh asked me to do this, and I count it a privilege and a joy to be able to teach God's Word. There's nothing like good Bible study. Amen. You can never exhaust God's Word. I knew a preacher one time, uh, he's, don't, he's long gone, he was a fine man of God, and he told me, or he told the church, he said that he was praying one time, and he preached for years, and he said he just fell down and said, God, I have preached your Word through. And he said he heard the audible voice of God laughing at him for making such a statement. You can never exhaust the Word of God. You can never find the end to it and what it has for us. Amen. But uh, uh, this evening we're going to start the study and uh, on the temple, and we're looking at maybe two, maybe three weeks, maybe longer, depending on how just how far we dig into this study. And uh, like I say, I want tonight to be like an introduction into the study of the temple. And the reason for this study is to look at all the minute details and the instructions that God gave Moses way back then when it came to the construction of the tabernacle and also their spiritual significance of what each and everything that God told him to do, the spiritual significance in those things. Now concerning the temple, God gave Moses exact specifications concerning every detail of the tabernacle, which in the wilderness was actually a tent. Uh, the various instruments of service and the surrounding walls and boards at that time of the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was planned and made to be mobile. In other words, taken down and put back up as needed when they moved. Reason being was Israel was uh, to be on the move toward the promised land. And we know the story of how it took 40 years before they actually got there. But uh, that's the reason for it to be in a tent in the beginning. I want us to also look at the many different materials that was used and how they were used as well. The items uh, that were to be in the tabernacle, all the things that were to be done in a certain way and a certain time. Uh, and one of those, each one of those items had a very significant spiritual meaning then as they do today in our temple the temple of the holy ghost and uh 
But God was very meticulous in His instructions to Moses when it came to how the tabernacle was to be constructed, how the priest was to be dressed, certain kind of garments to include exactly how they were to be made. Uh, he was very meticulous on how the priestly duties were to be carried out in the temple, especially when it came to the sacrifices and entering into the Holy of Holies. God gave specific directions on how these things were to be done. The details was given to Moses by God concerning the tabernacle, and it was very serious business to the point that if uh, any of these details was left out or overlooked or done carelessly, it could cost somebody their life. As we will see, when Aaron's sons, the Bible says, offered strange fire and God struck them down. They were priests in the temple. And they got careless. And I, I've been looking into this one time, and, and it was says that they had done got haphazardly, nonchalantly doing things. When it comes to God's work, it's very serious. And, and that's the reason God gave divine instructions on how things were to be done. Uh, in this introduction, I want to go over some of the events tonight uh, in the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus that led up to the point of the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And I also want to let you know that this, is, this study is an uh, open forum. Don't hesitate to throw your hand up if you've got something you want to say or ask. I don't promise you I've got all the answers. You know, we can ask Josh, get him to answer them if I don't. But uh, uh, you may have studied or talked about or learned something that uh, we not, we're not covering. By all means, free, feel free to ask or, 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 or raise your hand and uh, make a statement. But when I was a pastor at Oakland, Oakland Church of God, uh, we had started a Wednesday night uh, Bible study, Journey Through the Old Testament. And it's important to know the things of the Old Testament. Even though it's the Old Testament, we don't do things quite that way because of the New Testament. The Old Testament, it, 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 uh, it brings out the things that are in the New Testament. Without it, we wouldn't have the New Testament. It's still God's Word. Even though we don't offer sacrifices on the altar no more, all those things were very significant and still are today. And uh, but we was in it a little over a year and, and it had only gotten up to where David was about to be king. Uh, but it was a real good study. I learned a lot of things. Not to mention that we went through the MIP. We had to do a be tested on the book journey through the Old Testament. I learned a lot. But back to the introduction. Keep in mind that. Up until the point of the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was no designated church buildings. Uh, not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Uh, as a matter of fact, Israel was not even a nation yet. Uh, but we do read about certain men of God who built altars unto the Lord up until that point. These altars were built for a number of reasons. The primary reason, of course, was for animal sacrifice, worship unto the Lord. In fact, the Hebrew word for altar is generally translated as to slaughter. Uh, in the Greek, it means a place of sacrifice. We will see how the altar was very, it was a very important part of the temple, of the tabernacle and the temple that was also built in Jerusalem. Uh, the temple was where God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. It was upon the altars that hundreds of thousands of animals, animals were slaughtered down through the years for, uh, as for blood sacrifice for men's sin, which was done once a year. We'll get into that. It's important to keep all these things about this temple in mind, especially when we read uh, New Testament scriptures such as 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. It says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you? Whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And the reason I say that, it was most important then how the temple was treated and how it was, things were to be done. It's still most important about God's temple today. Amen. Altars were also made for such things as worship and to uh, commemorate an encounter with God. In the book of Genesis, we see that God chose Abraham and uh, it would be through his lineage that the nation of Israel would come and also through his lineage, Jesus the Messiah would come. After Adam and before Abraham, 
God still communed with man. Even though sin had separated mankind from Him in the garden, uh, God still loved His creation. He still loved mankind. And uh, He actually had a plan of salvation from the beginning, as we'll see. In the book of Genesis, as you read the lineage of Abraham, I mean Adam, I'm sorry, we read about a man or men such as Enoch. Genesis 5 and 24, it tells us that Enoch walked with God. Enoch was the father of Methuselah, who was the grandfather of Noah. And by the time that uh, Noah had come around, the Bible tells us the world had grown so wicked to the point that God was going to destroy the world with a flood. It says that man's heart was continually evil all the time. Uh, the first altar we read about was built by Noah immediately after the flood. Now that keep in mind, that's the first one that we read about. Uh, we also read in Genesis where Cain and Abel offered their sacrifices, and you know that story, how that Cain, his sacrifice was rejected. So I'm certain, the Bible let's say that they built an altar. If Abel offered a blood sacrifice, I'm pretty sure these things were on an altar. But anyway, just saying that about the altar. Anyway, Genesis 8.20 says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast out of every clean towel and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And uh, we also will find that nearly every prominent person after him in the Old Testament made an altar unto God at some point. We read where Abraham built four altars, one out of obedience to the voice of God in which he was to lay his son Isaac on as a sacrifice unto God, which was also symbolic to what God the Father would do for the whole world in the future. After this, this was planned from the time of Adam's fall in the garden, like I said earlier. And we see in Genesis 5, I mean, 3 and 15, it says, The Lord speaking to the devil, the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. At that time, God had already made a plan. That in the future, I'm going to redeem man back to me. And that woman's seed he was referring to whose heel would be bruised was Jesus. He said, you, you'll injure him, but he will destroy you. And he destroyed the work to the devil on the cross. Amen. That's the reason that veil in that temple at that time was rent from top to bottom. Because it was no longer needed. A new covenant. A new testament. The blood of Jesus Christ forever. Ain't that wonderful? That's what the gospel is all about. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus would eventually, what he was saying to him in the garden, undo what Adam done to us. Amen. I've always referred to Adam threw us under the bus, but Jesus fixed all that when he went to the cross. In Genesis, we read of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And these are known as the patriarchs of the Old Testament. It was through Joseph and his family that Israel went down into Egypt. You know the story. His brothers hated him, sold him into bondage. And this was all part of God's plan. He went from the pit to the palace. Amen. In Egypt. Uh, there they went. They went as a family of approximately 70 people. And some 400 years later they came out as a nation of over 2 million strong. When they were brought out of Egypt. Uh, they were led out by Moses, who was commanded by God to go to Egypt and bring his people out. You know the story, the burning bush, uh, how Moses was brought up in the household of Pharaoh. All of this was God's plan to eventually bring him back as a savior, so to speak, a typical of Jesus Christ, to redeem the people and bring them out of bondage uh, to a nation, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, keep, keep in mind up until this point, down through the generations of them being in Egypt, the children of Israel were taught about God. They were taught about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. And at one time there in Egypt, Joseph was considered a hero in Pharaoh's eyes. And as a matter of fact, all of Egypt's eyes. And, but after 400 years, we read in Exodus 1 and 8, it says, Now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And uh, I have preached on that. We have a generation that has arose that know not God's word. There's a big difference now 
Amen. And I'm not going to get into all that, but this new king that arose had forgot about all the good things that Joseph done for Egypt and the people of Egypt. There's a whole world in that area at that time. And he saw them as a threat because there were so many of them. So he put them in bondage and made them work as slaves. You know the story. And uh, you know the story of Moses, how he was chosen by God to lead the people out of Egypt. Uh, for 400 years, they were in bondage in Egypt. And uh, they had heard all about the Lord God, Jehovah. Now they was about to see him show up and show out on their behalf to get them out of the land of Egypt. You know the story of how God, through Moses, brought the plagues down on Pharaoh and he eventually released God's people. It was the last plague that was brought down on them, which uh, on Egypt, that actually broke Pharaoh's will. And this is where we see the first Passover of the things that was going to be done in the temple on a yearly basis. And more than that, as far as uh, blood sacrifice, you know the story of how that uh, God told Moses that the death angel was going to come down into the land and he was, they was given divine specific instructions on what to do as far as get, taking the family, get them in the house, take that spotless lamb, slay it, take the blood, cast it over the doorpost and says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Even way back then, the significance of these things are seen in the temple. And they are that is the story of the gospel today. Amen? When my name is called in glory, he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It's not how good I've been all my life. It's not the good things that I've done. It's only if I have the blood of Jesus applied to my soul. Amen? That's the only thing that's going to matter. All these other things are good. Amen? The good things, the good deeds, the good things, the works of the gospel that we do are good. Amen? But you, if you don't have the blood, amen, it does not matter how good a person may have been. Amen. But anyway, we, uh, we, we know how God brought them across the Red Sea. How He destroyed Pharaoh and his armies in the Red Sea. And now, on the other side of the Red Sea, we see Moses, the leader of over two million Jews, God's promise to Abraham hundreds of years earlier are coming to fruition. We're about to see it, a nation evolve here now. Uh, another point to look at is getting such a large group of people out of Egypt and into the, into the area of Mount Sinai was no small task. Uh, biblical scholars say it probably took at least three months to get to Mount Sinai from Egypt. And as I said earlier, they were no longer a, pro a family of approximately 70 people, but a nation now of over 2 million. And, in, and an important ingredient to being a nation is having a law. You know, what we see, especially in the day that we're living in now, what happens when law is swept aside. There's no law and order. Amen? There's no law and order. Anything goes. Amen? If there's no law, the nation will go down, amen, under turmoil and chaos. God knew for them to be established as a nation, they've got to have law. And that was just one of the reasons, amen. But it's here at Mount Sinai that God gives his law to Moses. One preacher said it like this, and I remember well. Uh, was, he said that when God gave his law to his people, what he was saying to his people is, let me introduce myself. All they had heard of up to that point was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the great things and promises. They had. But now God was speaking to the people. I want you to know me. I want you to know about me. And, and, and you know, anything and everything that we know about God is only what He has allowed us to know or reveal to us. But He will reveal Himself to, them to you. The Lord let me know a long time ago as a, a young Christian. He said, you can walk as close to me as you want to. I've said it many times from the pulpit. You will get out of serving God exactly what you put into it. Amen. When God says, He says, you will search for me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Nothing else between you and God. Nothing else in your life between you and God. Then God sees that. And I promise you, He will reveal Himself to you. Amen. But here we see that they are now becoming a nation. And God is about on Mount Sinai is going to uh, give Moses his laws. Amen. 
also known as the Ten Commandments to begin with. The children of Israel were at Mount Sinai for about a year. Uh, there was a lot of things that needed to happen uh, for, as far as them to go on forward toward the promised land and to become a nation. The, the law was written down. It, it was uh, to be encoded. It was at Mount Sinai where uh, God uh, gave Moses the detailed description as to uh, how the tabernacle was to be built and everything that is in it. Uh, and this is where the first tabernacle was built there at Mount Sinai. God was putting things in order. We finna get rolling here as a nation. These are the things you need to do. And uh, he, he gave divine instruction. Uh, also there, he gave divine instruction on how the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was to be built. And that's where actually God would be his dwelling place. Not, not that God was only there and nowhere else. God is everywhere, but this, it, was, it was symbolic to his presence. And that's the reason couldn't just anybody go walking up into the Holy Holies. You drop dead. Amen. I've heard a lot of people tell me, say, well, if God is so real, how come I can't see him? I said, if he was to allow you to do that, you would drop dead. Amen. If you was to see him in his full glory, you would disintegrate. That's the only, thing, that's the only way I know how to explain it. Because when Moses was on the mountain, he asked God, and Moses was God's friend, God's servant. He said, let me see your glory. He said, you cannot see me and live. No man can look upon me and live. And, and, but God loved Moses so much, and I know I'm getting a little off track. He said, but this I'll do for you. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over, and when I pass by, I'll remove my hand, and you can see my hinder parts. And God allowed him to do that. And even after that, when Moses went back down to the camp, the people couldn't look at him because he glowed, because he had been in the presence of God Almighty. Amen. I don't know about you, but that stuff, I love that stuff. Amen. Amen. I just can't wait to get there when I'm in that glorified body and I'll be able to see him as he is. Amen. And, and as far as that goes, if someone says, why can't I see God? Why don't you just go out and look up into a clear night? Look around you. Amen. You can see God and his creation everywhere. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me go on. Later on you'll see in not just ten commandments, but in uh, over 600 Levitical laws on their books that covered about anything and everything you could possibly think of that might come up in everyday life of the people of the nation of Israel. All these laws was given to Moses by God from the door of the tabernacle. The tabernacle in the wilderness. One might ask, uh, if you read about all these laws, it says, why was uh, so much of the law expressed in negative terms? And, and there was and is a reason. Uh, the law presupposes the existence of sin and evil in man's heart. If there is no law against something, then it's not against the law. There were some things that God did not want man to do. There was things that was wrong for man to do, as is today. That's the reason He gave His law saying, Do not, thou shalt not. Amen. You go down the road, the, Bible, the road sign says speed limit, 55. If there's no speed limit signs, there's no speed limit, you can go as fast as you want to. But you can't because there's a law and there's a sign stating that. I try to tell my wife that all the time when she's flying down the road. Amen. Those blue light comes on, she reminds her. It reminds her. But anyway, it, it tells us what is wrong. It lets us know what is wrong. It lets us know what sin is. It is what the law done. And uh, it had been way since Adam that this had happened. But God wanted man to know what sin was. And uh, have you ever heard someone say, well, God knows my heart. You may have said it. I've said it myself. As if we know our intentions and so does God. But listen to Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God does know it. And He knows what was in the heart of man. So He gave the law to go by so that man just wouldn't run rampant and do anything and everything that feels good to the flesh, which a lot of do, to, do today. Proverbs 4 and 23 reads, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it 
or the issues of life. Now the Bible isn't talking about that muscle that pumps blood through our, our, our body. Uh, he's talking about the inner being of man. When he talks about the heart of man, he's talking about who you really are on the inside. Amen. And uh, God knows our heart. He does. And we don't know it like we think we do. And, you know, sometimes. But anyway, basically there are four purposes of God's law or the law. And one is the law is to reveal the holiness of God. Like I said earlier, holiness is not a denomination. We've been referred to as the holiness church. Well, God's coming after a church that is holy. He's coming after a people that is holy. Holiness is not a denomination. Holiness is a way of living. I'm not saying perfect, amen, but there it goes to our heart. God knows our heart. When you make a mistake, you'll know it, and you'll repent, and you'll ask God to forgive you, amen? But anyway, that, it reveals to His people the, His holiness of who He is. When God gave His commandments and the details of His law, He pointed to His holiness. He is a righteous God, and these laws reflect the, His absolute and unique holiness. His scriptures do. His word tells us that. Amen? Secondly, the law reveals the sinfulness of the human heart. And I referred to that earlier in the comment about our heart. The law also reveals how much mankind needs salvation. And that is something that we could not do ourselves. It, it simply means deliverance from a condition which man cannot rescue himself. The law makes us aware of the dilemma and our inability to correct it. Uh, Jesus was in the garden praying. In the Garden of Gethsemane when the Bible says that his, he was under such duress and stress that his sweat became his great drops of blood. And he cried, if, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There was no other way. There was no other plan of salvation. Only through Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we be saved? There is no other way. And lastly, the law is designed to preserve the chosen people of God. It was given to preserve Israel as a nation. The Ten Commandments and the other approximately 600 uh, commandments were things to govern the civil life, the religious life, and the everyday life of the people of Israel. And that's why the law was given. My next study, I want to get into to the actual part where God has given Moses the command to build a tabernacle. And if you want to uh, maybe look into it but before then, Look at Exodus 25, verses 1 through 9. This is where God commands him, build me a tabernacle. There were certain things, it was, and, and certain ways to get the stuff that it was to be built with. And all of these things is when we start going to getting into the, the tabernacle itself and what each thing means. So please study and uh, uh, have something to bring. Anybody got anything else? I told you we're going to keep you very long tonight, but I just wanted to give you a little... Quick run through from the Genesis all the way up to this point. Does anybody got any question, anything I may have overlooked or something of significance that you may have seen that I didn't mention? Praise the Lord. He's doing pretty good. Amen. But Amen. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I, I I left out one part of that scripture that I read in, in uh, about the our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
the, the, it also goes on to say, he that defiles God's temple, he, God will destroy. And that's the reason it was so important back then to, uh, you just didn't bebop up into the temple and say, I'm here to see the priest. You would be struck dead. Amen. You would be calling defiling the temple. And the same thing with our bodies. You know, ain't you glad that we live under the dispensation of grace? By His mercies, we are not uh, consumed. Amen. Amen. They're renewed each day. I would have been destroyed a long time ago. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not perfect. I've made a, some doozies. Thank God for His grace. Amen. And I'm pretty sure that y'all have too. Amen. But it is important. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If the temple in that day where God dwelt was so important that He did not want it defiled, this temple is just as important. Amen. Because He dwells. He's not going to dwell in an unclean temple. And I'm not throwing off another denomination or nothing about once saved, always saved. All you got to do is make a trip to the altar and you can go back out and start living your life the same you was, same way you was. I got a problem with that. I got one of my pastors one time was a bastard. I, 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 <laughs> he wasn't that. He was a Baptist ministry. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. He was a, he was, <laughs> he was a Baptist minister <laughs> who was one time a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, I believe the man was a man of God with all his heart. Josh and Ashley knew him well. Brother Gene Rosenbaum. He said, the biggest hype I get from people is, oh, so you in that uh, religion where you can do anything you want to and get saved to do anything you want to. He said, no, sir. He said, your want to needs to be checked on. If you get saved and you still want to go party in the bars, you get still saved and you still want to go commit adultery and do these things, you ain't get saved. And he brought that out very well, I think. It's what you want to do. Because when I got saved, a change took place. I didn't want to do those things no more. And when I did do them, I felt horrible. Amen. Because of the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else got anything? Hopefully we're going to have some photos and stuff of the tent and the tabernacle. And um, I hope that you get something out of this study. Amen. All hearts and minds clear. What else you want to I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Josh. Amen. Let's give him another hand for sharing with us this evening. I'll go ahead. I, I appreciate him uh, bringing us in. I know. Uh, bringing it up, you may not know what to expect. Maybe you thought we was going to get into the heart of the tabernacle tonight, but um, anybody that's ever been through any, any kind of speech class, uh, public speaking class, um, but especially if you've been in any kind of sermon preparation class, you know that every good sermon starts with an introduction. So I'm thankful for an introduction that leads us up so we'll have an understanding of why we are talking about what we're doing. There's a lot of good information shared tonight. And um, I, I, like I said, this is leading up to a sermon that God's been really dealing with me about the last few months that I've been praying about, working on. And I felt led to ask him back in early December to do this series starting out the year because um, I know God wants me to preach that message here in the upcoming weeks. But um, you, w one thing you're going to realize, and I'll go ahead and give you a peek at, at the sermon, is everything that we're talking about, everything, the laws, the things... Everything that was done in the Old Testament, you know, a lot of people think, well, Jesus come away and done away with it. No, but what we understand is the Israel of the Old Testament was a physical location. It is a spiritual location in the New Testament. We are the church. We are grafted in. Everything, those laws, those things, God still has a, has a, um, a law for us. He still has a command for us. And, and, and the enemy doesn't come as, as you know, the media knights or, or anything like that, he, you know, dressed in armor and ready to fight hand in hand. But he comes in a spiritual sense, just like I shared this past week. Those, those guys' names that were over those different companies that came against Nehemiah, one of them was his name meant may sin come to life. I mean, and that is a spiritual. That's when we can look at the Old Testament, get these things and apply them. But going on to the temple, what God has do, done in the Old Testament, there was a purpose for it and he put order there everything must be done decent and in order according to the book of corinthians everything must be done decent in order god is a god of order 
He is not a God of disorder. When you see disorder taking place, whether it be in the church, there's a lot of times we can say, yeah, there's a lot of disorder in the church. But honestly, how many times do we look at our lives and, and can admit there's disorder in our individual lives? Disorder starts in the house of God. The house of God ain't this building right here. When you say, I'm going to the house of God, you, you, you might be going to Northwoods Church, but the house of God is you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Judgment starts in the house of God. And when we start getting into this study, which I'm excited about, and you start seeing the things that was done there, and then I can add on to it with the sermon that God's been dealing with me about, about the spiritual aspects of the time and era in which we are living, um, it's going to go hand in hand, I'm telling you, because all the little parts of the temple, the, the outer courts, the inner courts, the Holy of Holies, the showbread, the, the, ta- uh, the, the Holy of Holies with the um, Ark of the Covenant, with the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, uh, the, the cherubim's wings stretched forth, all that stuff's going to play a part in what God's dealing, dealing with us on in this modern day, and I'm excited about it. So please, guys, um, if you can make an effort, come. Take you some notes so that when we do get through this, and we get to the sermon, you can, you can go back and you can do a personal study. Because I promise you, in this sh- series that we're doing now, and in one, one sermon, possibly two sermons later, it's not going to give you everything you need to know. As my dad started out with, you cannot exhaust the Word of God. And uh, bring stuff to the Bible study. As he gave you the scriptures to go home and read, go home and, and read it. And if there's something maybe you're having trouble understanding or something that sticks out to you that you think is a good point, bring it next Wednesday. As he said earlier, this is an open forum. Um, open discussion is one of the best ways of teaching and learning. So uh, we learn best when we teach ourselves. Uh, we just don't understand that. So, but anyhow, all hearts and minds clear. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. 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 And that's why, you know, the, the, even little things that a lot of times we think churches are being so over uh, judgmental about, like asking some, uh, an elderly lady asking you to take your hat off in church. A lot of times we'll get mad. This hat ain't got nothing to do with it. But you got to understand, if that woman's been a Bible study, a uh, Bible scholar her whole life, and she's learned the reverence of the temple, it might God might not, not be convicting you of your hat. And listen, I think there's a, there's a line we can come to meet. I think there's an overstep and a boundary when you start putting rules on everybody, and then there's also um, just not having reverence of the holy temple. And, and listen, walking in here and sitting on these pews again, this is not the holy temple. This becomes a holy atmosphere because like-minded people with the, with the like-minded spirit comes together and the Holy Spirit is activated to move not only in us but around us. And that's where you get baptisms of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's important for church attendance. You say, well, if I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, why do I need to go to church? Because a congregation of believers that comes together sets an atmosphere for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to take place. Nobody gets baptized in a drop of water, but you accumulate many, many millions of molecules of water together and get a river, you can baptize whole bodies. And that's what we are here to do is to become a river of living water that flows from us that outsiders will be baptized and grafted into where we are. Again, going back to the temple, the outer courts, the inner courts, and the Holy of Holies are out. Word appearances, our outward, our everyday lives, the inner course, that time we spend with the Lord in the Holy of Holies, the place where nobody can get to unclean. And you have to know that you have a Holy of Holies, that you possess the power of the Holy Spirit. But, you, but if you're not careful, the world will, will, will cause you to forget that, that you have that power and you have that liberty, you have that freedom, and you will allow unclean things 
into your temple. So with that being said, um, this is going to give you, I think, a good understanding, a good outlook on to what, what's going on in the church today. Why do some churches do this? Why do some churches do that? At the end of the day, you'd be surprised that a lot of your denominational churches aren't very different. It's little minute details like a simply, you know, this one believes you speak in tongues out loud in a church. Well, this one believes you only speak in tongues in a prayer closet. This, you know, I'm like Paul. I just wish, I mean, I, I, I say speak in tongues more than you all, but I would rather you just glorify God in whatever language you do it in and let him take care of the rest. Amen. And I promise you, if you'll ever experience it, you'll be glad you do. So I always pray it. Like Paul also said, he said, I wish you would all do it. He said, but I'd rather you speak five words that are understood that glorifies God than a thousand that mean nothing. All right. Any, any questions, any hearts, all hearts and minds clear? Anybody want to add, take from it, throw something? All right. All right. Will you stand all over the house? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I pray that you can be with us next week as we get into the tabernacle um, forefront and getting ready to hit this thing head on. I'm excited about it. Again, it'll be next Wednesday at 7 p.m. So uh, hope to see you there. If, you, if for some reason you can't make it, listen, it will be better live and in person. But if for some reason you can't be here on Wednesday night, please, guys, uh, tune in to the live feed. It'll be on at uh, 7 p.m. as well on Facebook Live. So you can join us there also. And we will uh, gladly share the, the uh, study with you there. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you tonight for your many blessings. Lord, I thank you for this series that we are embarking on, God, that I believe, Lord, this will be a journey, Lord God, that can do just totally radicalize our, our understanding, Lord Father, taking us to a closer relationship with you, Lord, because I believe, Father, that you are calling today in this modern day time, Lord, uh, uh, for people to separate from what is just looks right to be to becoming people of knowledge that knows right, God. I, I pray, Lord, that you would just move in a mighty way, Lord, and just touch uh, Brother Mike as he brings this word, Lord God, touch each and every person as they study it ahead of time, God, and give us understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. I pray, God, that you would just move in a mighty way. Keep your hands on us throughout the series this coming Sunday, Lord, and just give us uh, a move of your spirit like, like we've been hungry for, God. I just ask you right now to be with every family as they go through different situations, different trials, different circumstances, Father. Those dealing with viruses, those dealing with losses, God. Those dealing with uh, situations and issues that are that are just hurting them, God. Those dealing with the fear and anxiety of what this nation is going through at this very moment, God. I pray, Lord, that you would give uh, just a revival in our nation today, God. That those that are hungry and seeking your face will come to know, Lord, that we are in the palm of your hand and no man can pluck us away. So, God, we thank you. We give you the praise. We give you the honor and the glory. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight. We love you and see you Sunday morning. Also, if you have an offering, don't forget you can drop it off up here on your way out. We love you.